Hey, friends. Uh, it's great to be with all of you. For those of you that I have not had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Blake Shook. I'm one of the owners of the Bee Supply and a longtime beekeeper. Um, I started keeping bees when I was about 12 as a hobby and then um, really just grew my beekeeping business through high school, turned it into a from a small scale business to a sideline to commercial. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. One, one of these days I'll do a I'll take 15, 20 minutes uh, and just kind of do uh, my story on how I got started in beekeeping, show you guys pictures of what a year in the life of bee, you know, full-time beekeeper looks like. And, uh, but I'll probably save that for like, you know, November or December when I'm like struggling with what to talk about because it's the dead of winter. Uh, there's two things I want to do this winter. I want to talk about just kind of a year in the life. Um, and I want to do kind of a virtual tour of uh, where we package our honey um, and some of the behind the scenes of our beekeeping operation. So uh, this summer, this winter, I hope to do that. So jumping right in, guys, I, there's a lot of great things that we get to talk about today. Even though we're headed towards winter, we still have a lot of bee management time left and a lot of very critical things to cover to make sure that um, our bees are ready to go into winter. And if you live in the South, my goodness, it's still hot outside. It's hard to think about talking uh, about fall and winter. I was out um, filming today uh, in the bee yard for this webinar, and it was 109. And I didn't get the film as much as I wanted to because my phone and, and video equipment kept dying because it was overheating <laughs> just from being in the sunlight. So I was out there talking about, uh, you know, fall and getting your bees ready for winter and making sure they have enough food for winter. And it's 109 now, like you're dying because it's, it's so hot outside. So, uh, but it's coming. It's, it's uh, some of you listening may be in areas that it's already chilly. Uh, you know, it's going to cool off here in the South next week. We might actually get some rain, which we haven't had in 60 plus days. Um, my brother, uh, my younger brother, is the manager of our commercial beekeeping operation. Uh, and he's a brilliant beekeeper. I'm, I'm, one of these days I'll get him on here. Uh, he's, he's a brilliant, brilliant beekeeper. And he, he runs our whole migratory commercial operation. And uh, he moves with his family up to the Dakotas, North Dakota, uh, where our bees spend the summer because it's so hot and so dry in Texas that you know we move our bees up north because um, it's cooler at 75 degrees all summer. And there's, you know, by the time all the flowers are dying here in Texas in late June, spring is just starting up there. So we take our, the same bees and make another honey crop up in North Dakota. And so um, my brother Cade moves all, the, all of our bees up there and then he lives up there with his family. And, uh, you know, 75 degrees, 80 at the most, you know, and, and uh, he was, he came back just for a day. We had a meeting uh, yesterday and uh, he was showing me pictures of North Dakota right now. And it was just, it's fall. Like the trees are all turning. It's chill in the air. It's 40 degrees at night. So uh, pretty, pretty crazy, pretty different than, uh, than we're experiencing here in the, here in the South. So, um, so quick reminder, as we jump in, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box and uh, let's let's get started. So before we jump out to the bee yard, a couple notes here. Uh, Stan Soft Sugar Bricks uh, are in stock. Um, I don't think they're going to go out of stock again. Last year, they sold so well that we had a really hard time keeping them in stock. This year, um, I took some pictures but I was out in the BR filming videos and got back just in time to start the webinar. So I didn't have time to put them on here, but the Stan sugar bricks have kind of taken over a corner of our bottling room and we've got a big oven set up and cooling trays. And I took some pictures, but I'll show, show them to you guys next month. But uh, we, we dramatically ramped up production and uh, we should have those in stock from here on out without any, any problems. Um, so this is super cool. I did a video on this, so you'll see this out in the bee yard, but this is the no-kill CO2 Varroa tester. This is a new product um, and it, it's in stock online. It's in, it's in uh, one of our stores, um, but not in all of our stores yet because it just came in yesterday. So before you drive out to a store to pick it up, give them a call, make sure they have it in stock, but it is available online on our website. 
And I'll, I'll do a video. I, I did a video, but basically you can test for varroa mites without killing the bees. And I'll show you how on the video out in the bee yard just in a minute. But this is in stock online. The big announcement is that we have bees available for pre-order. So we just opened this up a couple of days ago. If you want to pre-order bees for 2024, whether it's singles or packages or nooks, um, we, they are open. The big advantage to getting your order in now is you can pick any dates that you want because they're all open and they're all available. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks from now, those early dates will start filling up. So if you want bees for 2024, go ahead and get them reserved. Um, and I don't know if I have uh, the one quick note is on packages. We are planning to ship packages or you can pick up packages in store. Um, the only other really quick thing I wanted to throw out there is that um, we we have modified our golden cordovan breed a little bit. So the golden cordovans we raised to be crazy, crazy gentle. That's always been the objective for our, our golden cordovans. Is that like if you've got bees in an urban backyard or a rooftop apiary, you've got a lot of kids that are looking at the bees. You know, the golden cordovan is a super, super gentle bee. When you breed really hard for one trait like gentleness it can be really hard to um it can be really hard to have all the other traits like varroa mite resistance and just a really tough bee uh disease resistance um it can be hard to keep all those traits so we've we've been experimenting we experimented a lot this year and we're going to roll it out fully for 2024 but we're actually taking our golden cordovan and we're working more of our Texas 5000 genetics into the Golden Cordovan line. So they're still going to be super gentle, um, but they're also going to be a hardier, tougher bee than they have been historically. So pretty excited about that. They're going to be slightly darker. They're not going to be quite as that blonde color, uh, that really, really light color. But you'll still get the gentleness, but you kind of have um, a bee not quite as tough as the Texas 5000, but a lot of those tough more resistant, more pole line genetics, we're moving into the golden Cordovans as well. So kind of cool. Uh, last advertisement before we talk about the magazine. Um, we're, I've got this a video about this in the B-Yard, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we just came out with this product for our sugar bricks. And this basically keeps the sugar brick, or it works with pollen patties, elevated about three-eighths of an inch above the top bars. Um, that way the bees can get to all sides of the sugar brick or all sides of the pollen patty. And this means that varroa, uh, uh, small hive beetles can't get on the underside and start laying eggs and you, you don't have a small hive beetle problem. When you lay a pollen patty or lay a sugar brick directly on the top bars, the bees can't get completely under that feed um, and the, the, the small hive beetles will lay eggs larvae will hatch and you can start creating a small hive beetle problem. With this shim, um, it, it keeps it slightly elevated, so that's not a problem. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in the video. Uh, Sherry, tell us what's going on with the magazine this month. There's James, too. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> I told him, I said, I want you to know, stick your hand out so everybody can see you. I tell you, I love this cover. Did anybody notice this when it came out? If you travel the trade shows, the beekeeping trade shows, a friend, Jose Madrigal, is a wonderful pollinator photographer. And just for you, he has given us the permission to use this, this photo. And I can't remember what month it's in, but he is giving our readers 30% off the 2024 calendar that he produces every year that's going to have all kinds of pollinators. It's gorgeous. So flip when you open the magazine on the contents page, bottom right hand side, look and see the code is B Supply 30, I believe, and you'll get 30% off. But I love that cover. So anyway, I digress, but it's gorgeous. Good guy, too. Um, this month, building winter hives. And I know that bees, I know that uh, Blake's going to talk a lot about what's in this issue, but I'll show you real, real quick. Equalizing your bee yard, biggie deal, biggie deal. Fall splits, you know, this is your, kind of your last opportunity. Some queens are we're about done, so you better get her done. And my favorite thing in the whole magazine, I've got to admit it, y'all, I got to interview the dirt rooster. 
And I will, I will say I'm a fan. If you are a YouTube fan and you like to follow YouTube star beekeeping stars, and I'll call him that, then go to this publication. It has my interview with Randy McCaffrey, the dirt rooster out of Mississippi. And we had a great long visit. You'll enjoy it. It's super good. All right, Blake, I'm ready for the for the spotlight. All right, so I didn't pick an, a long one to talk to you about, and we'll just briefly hit on it. Um, I got to thinking, as a beekeeper, wouldn't it be cool if we could just look in a little window and say, I wonder what, I wonder what? Well, you know, NOAA, and that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I had to write that down because it, it doesn't just roll off my no. tongue. <laughs> NOAA, <laughs> so much easier to say. Um, they come out every year with a, uh, we'll call it a guesstimate on what predicting fall temperatures and conditions like um, rainfall and such. And in looking at that and plugging that into beekeeping, we really can use this as a tool. And I wrote just a really short article about it, but knowing and being able to estimate what's about to happen, is it gonna be extra cold? Is it gonna be extra wet or the opposite? will tell me that I've got to get out there and I've got to either feed longer or I need to make preparations for the bees to not be in wind or cold or what. It just gives you more opportunity to be plugged into what the bees may be needing from you coming fall. So check it out. It's page 22. It's pretty cool. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I love that. And I, I actually use um, I use those predictions as well. I mean, for my own operation, I use uh, that one, and then I use the uh, the drought um, monitor all the time. I've got a I've got a slide about that later tonight. But um, yeah, the U.S. drought monitor I use that all the time. And if I see that I'm in a major drought area, I, I know I've got to pay close attention to my nutritional uh, how I'm handling my bees nutritionally. And then this is super helpful too because it kind of gives me a, an insight into. I might have to feed a little bit longer, um, et cetera. So super helpful tools. All right, so let's jump out into the BR. Friends, so I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is it's September, which means fall is right around the corner. Uh, if you're in the South uh, or Central United States, you know, we're not too far from some cooler days. If you're up North, fall's already here. If you're in the Southeast, then bless your heart, you know, you don't get winter anyway, so you're kind of out of luck, but um, it's 109 degrees right now. Um, I, I usually film these videos, you know, the day of the webinar, uh, the monthly buzz, and um, I should have filmed it a couple days ago because it was cooler. It's 109 right now. It's going to be 106 tomorrow, and then in North Texas where I live, it's uh, cooler from here on out. So uh, I almost made it to cooler weather, but it's it's crazy hot out here today. So got a lot to look at. Um, I've got some new cool products and uh, things to show you guys. And then we're really going to just be looking at, um, hey, as we go into fall, even though it doesn't feel like it right now, as we go into fall, what do we need to be paying attention to in our bees? And that's really important because for a lot of the U.S., like we'll talk about later tonight, it's very hot, it's very dry, and it has been, more importantly, it has been for a long time, which has a big impact on our nectar and pollen flows. And that's really where we have to, as beekeepers, sometimes step in and make sure that as our bees are building winter bees, they have all the nutrients they need to do that successfully. And when it's, you know, in North Texas, where I live, where it hadn't really rained in 60 days, there's very poor quality fall forage available for them. So I'm going to be paying close attention to the nutritional needs of my bees uh, as we go into winter. So uh, let's jump right in. I am really, really excited about this product. So what I'm going to show you guys how to do is how to do a mite test. So, you know, keeping your mite levels low year round is very important, but it's never quite as critical as making sure your mite levels are low going into winter. A critical part of successfully controlling varroa mites is knowing what your varroa mite levels are and testing. You can use a sticky board. Um, that's not terribly accurate, but you can use a sticky board. Um, a more accurate method is an alcohol wash using this uh, Easy Varroa Check. And I've got other videos you can look at on our YouTube channel um, about how to use this with an alcohol wash. 
The unfortunate thing about an alcohol wash is that it kills bees. You can also do a powdered sugar roll. Um, they're not terribly accurate either. So this is a product that um, just came out and it's a CO2 cartridge. Now I mentioned this in one of our videos about a year ago, but it took a bit for them to be manufactured properly. And so it's a CO2 cartridge. Um, it dispenses CO2, it puts the bees to sleep and you can test for varroa mites and then it doesn't kill your bees, which is super, super cool. So I'm gonna show you guys uh, how, to, how to do this. So when you get this kit, it's gonna have a CO2 cartridge and the CO2 cartridge is not going to be uh, screwed into the container, it's gonna be separate. So you screw the CO2 cartridge into the head right here and you've got the one tip I've got for you, you've gotta screw this CO2 cartridge in really, really tight so that it punctures the cartridge. Then you screw this cap back on, screw it on tightly and you should be able to shoot out CO2. So next we've got to get our bees. So we've got to have our uh, Varroa easy test container. And what we're going to do is we're going to fill, there are, there are um, a, there's a line in the bottom of this white cup. That's the fill level for bees. So we want about 300 bees and we're going to fill them to that white line. So I'm gonna get bees. Ideally, you want bees that are from the brood nest area. And the big key is that you watch and make sure that uh, you do not get the queen. You do not want the queen in here. So whatever frame you're pulling bees off of, look carefully and make sure that the queen is not on that frame. So I don't see her. So. You can shake these bees onto a news sheet of newspaper and then kind of funnel them into this basket, but um, I don't have a sheet of newspaper. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my bee brush and I'm just gonna brush bees off this frame into this white basket until it's filled to that bottom line. Okay, so I'm filled to the bottom line. Now you're gonna turn this white cup upside down into your clear cup. So now the bees are trapped inside here. I'm gonna put my, I'm just gonna gently rest my yellow cap on top. Now for the fun part. I'm just gonna stick this nozzle between the yellow cap and the clear cap. Knock the bees down. And I'm going to spray for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Five seconds. Seal it up. It's going to take about 10 seconds for the bees to be put to sleep. And check that out. Hopefully you can see that. Look at that. The bees are totally put to sleep. They're totally knocked out. Isn't that cool? So next you're going to turn this upside down and you're going to gently shake it for about 15 seconds and those varroa mites are being dislodged from the bees they're shaking through that white container into the yellow cap so i'm not counting 15 seconds but i uh i think that was about 15 seconds then you're going to unscrew it Our bees are okay, they're still alive. You can kind of see that they're asleep, but they're kind of uh, coming back awake. And then in this yellow cap, we're going to count varroa mites. So let's see if I can get it to where you guys can see it. I don't know if you can see it, but there are two varroa mites in that cap, just little reddish dots on the, in the bottom of that container. There's two reddish dots that are varroa mites. I'm sorry, it's super sunny out here, so I can't see if you're able to see that or not, but there's two yellow dots. So this is 300 bees, two varroa mites. Um, our goal is one varroa mite per 100 bees. So if we found three varroa mites would be okay. The fact that I only found two, I'm okay with that.
And look at that, the bees are coming right back alive or awake. Um, I'm just going to gently dump them back into the hive. And they're, <clears throat> they're quickly waking up and we're done. So um, we do sell these. Uh, the manufacturer only made a handful of them and we got all that we could get. Um, but we do have several hundred available. I'm sure they're gonna go really, really fast, but we do have these. Uh, when they sell out, it's gonna take us a few months to get more, but we'll get more back in stock as quickly as we can. There you go. A question I get asked quite a bit is, how do I install this pollen patty in my hive? It's pretty simple. Um, you know, we won't get into what time of year and all that, but you know, uh, I recommend especially feeding pollen patties eight weeks before winter time hits. So that's eight weeks before you have daytime temperatures consistently in the 50s um, is when I encourage feeding. I usually feed four to five pounds of pollen substitute in the fall. Um, and when I'm feeding, uh, it's pretty simple. The goal is to get this patty in the heart of the hive where the most activity is. Bees are gonna remove this patty by eating it. They're gonna be licking it, trying to get it out of their way. And so you need this where there are a lot of bees so that you know, they get rid of it um, instead of it just sitting around drying out. So in general, I do not like to put it up under the lid. Um, I'm usually going to put it, well, I'm always going to put it between my two boxes. So that could be between these two upper boxes. If you've got good bee population, up here is fine. If there's not a lot of bee population, between these two boxes is fine. But I've got good bee population, so I'm just going to brush some of those bees out of the way, and I'm going to put it right in the middle of the brood box, uh, right in the middle of the hive, right on the top bars, and then lower my box back on top. And it'll kind of squish down between those boxes and the bees should eat it in seven to 10 days. If they haven't eaten, eaten it in seven to 10 days, you know, I usually pull it out, freeze it, so to kill any small hive beetle larva, um, and then you can put a fresh one on. That's it, simple as that. So we're gonna look at this hive in the context of what do they need before going into winter. Now, you know, depending on where you are in the country, this is super relevant or not. But, you know, usually I look at uh, four weeks before daytime temperatures are in the 50s, I need to have my hive 100% ready for winter. So however many pounds of honey you need in your area, varroa mites completely under control, you know, four weeks before daytime temperatures are in the 50s. If you're up north, that's like now. You know, if you're way down south, then you know, you've probably got six weeks to two months uh, before you get to that point. If you're in the southeast, you know, yeah, again, you never get there. Um, but when it comes to food, you know, if you're, if you're in the northern half of the United States, you know, you probably need, or really the northern third, you know, you need closer to 80 pounds of stored honey to overwinter. You know, if you're in the southern half or so, you know, you really need more like 40 pounds. So, and I want to be at that point four weeks before daytime temperatures consistently are in the 50s. Because even once you have cold fronts start blowing through and you've got days in the 60s and 50s, bees just stop taking and storing food efficiently. Um, so we're gonna look at this hive, see if they need food or not. The other huge caveat is, my goodness, look at the US drought map, uh, Google US drought monitor. Um, and if you're in a drought area, that's a great indication you should really be feeding pollen patties. You know, if you're in an area with a really strong fall nectar flow, a awesome fall pollen flow with a huge variety of pollen coming in like crazy, no drought, you, you can probably get away in many cases without feeding pollen patties. I don't think it's gonna hurt your bees. It's a good chance it'll still help them. Um, but especially if you're in a drought area, you know, if you're in Texas like I am, I mean, we're in a pretty rough drought. We haven't had a good rain in a long time. The fall pollen flow is terrible. Um, you need to be feeding a pollen patty every seven to 10 days. And that's ensuring that those developing baby bees that have to survive all winter long are being fed a proper nutritional diet so that they can survive the whole winter. If the bees don't have the nutritional resources to properly feed those developing bees, um, then they aren't gonna survive the winter. So, you know, if you're in a drought area um, or don't have a great po fall pollen flow, feed pollen patties as an insurance every seven to 10 days. So checking out this hive, the first thing I do, this top box, we just, this was just a honey super we put on after extraction and we fed them a couple gallons of syrup and you know, lifting up on it, 
you know, it's got about 30 pounds stored back in it um, from our feeding and a little bit of nectar they found somewhere. So, you know, all I really want this time of year, uh, as long as, you know, I, I'm about six weeks to seven weeks, knock on wood, from days in the 50s and 60s. So I really only want about 30 pounds since I've got a long way until I've got those daytime temperatures that are really cool. Um, so I'm probably not gonna be feeding this hive. Now, if I've got under 30 pounds, I'm gonna be giving them some gallons of syrup um, in September. The big thing I wanna see though, is I wanna make sure I haven't overfed. I wanna find frames that are mostly empty um, or that have plenty of room for the queen to still lay. So, you know, I've got a couple frames like this still in the hive where, you know, they're not completely full. They've got some open syrup and nectar, but you know, there's plenty of room for the bees to move honey out of the way if they want to give the queen somewhere to lay. And that's what's important. You know, I've got a handful of frames in here that, you know, this is, this is beautiful. I mean, this is exactly what I'm looking for this time of year. I've got cat brood all in the middle. I've got a thick band of honey around the edge. You know, that's really what I want to see. They're leaving this middle open for brood rearing. They're putting a thick band of honey around the edges of the frames in preparation for winter. That's what I want to see. You know, this box has probably 10 to 15 pounds of stored honey. So they've got, they've really got plenty of, they've got plenty of uh, stored nectar. The bottom box only, I would say, probably has about 10 pounds of stored honey in it but they've got plenty of honey up above. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, this is probably a hive I will only give a couple more gallons of feed to this year, and, and they'll, they should be in, in pretty good shape. Now I'm just, the other, the last thing I'm looking at is I still wanna see eggs and larvae, uh, but I'm not seeing a whole lot of pollen. So I really think that, again, this hive, I'm, well, <laughs> I'm feeding all of my hives um, a pollen patty every seven to 10 days across the board. Um, because what little pollen I am seeing in general right now just doesn't have a lot of variation to it. You not only need pollen, but you need variation in pollen, different colors. And I'm just not seeing that. So this hive has about six frames of brood, which isn't bad for this time of year, about what you would expect with the drought we've been in. Uh, they've got sufficient uh, stores but not a lot of pollen. So really all I'm doing to a hive like this is I am giving them a uh, pollen patty every seven to 10 days. I'm making sure the varroa mites are under one per 100 bees and that's it. I mean, I'll, I'll keep giving them pollen patties probably through mid October. Um, I'll probably give them a couple more gallons of syrup in early October just so they can kind of put that wherever they want it in their brood nest area. And other than that, this hive's good to go. Hey friends, I am really excited to talk to you about a new product that we just came out with. This is our internal sugar brick tray. And the idea behind this is to prevent small hive beetles from being a problem when you're feeding sugar bricks and when you're feeding uh, pollen patties, if you're in an area that has a lot of small hive beetles. Now, um, this is designed to fit inside your hive, and it's just a screened area. Um, the shim holds the sugar brick at the right height, um, you can see here, and the bees can feed on the underside of this sugar brick, and they can also feed on the top side. So bees can get to all sides of this sugar brick. So small hive beetles, if it was, if it was just sitting on the top bars, small hive beetles would start laying eggs underneath this, and the bees couldn't get to them to clean them out. So whether you're putting a sugar brick on this tray or a pollen patty or a sugar brick and a pollen patty, the bees can get to all sides of it to eat it and keep the small hive beetles at bay. Now, this works best with sugar bricks. It can work with pollen patties, but it's a must with sugar bricks. Pollen patties can work, um, but the, their bees are most attracted to the sugar bricks, and so they tend to come up and eat it most quickly when it's uh, sugar brick. The pollen patty, they tend to eat a little bit slower. A really good strong hive will still eat it in plenty of time, but a weaker hive may struggle coming all the way up to the top and eating that pollen patty. It's real simple. It just goes right on top of your hive, just like that, and you close the lid. In the summertime, it's a great um, spacer to give your, keep your bees a little bit cooler. And then the cool thing is, in the wintertime, 
when small hive beetles are not a problem, all you have to do is reverse it. So this sugar brick is too tall to be able to fit the lid on normally. So then you just take this screen and you turn it upside down, just like that. And now the sugar brick is directly on the top bars, which is no problem because there's not a threat of small hive beetles in the middle. Um, and you can put your lid on and this just acts as a spacer so your sugar brick can fit on top. So super cool. Um, a beekeeper in South Carolina, or North Carolina, sorry, came up with this. Brilliant guy. I was at a conference and he was showing me he built this. Um, I thought, wow, what a, what a great idea. Um, and uh, we modified it a little bit and I think it's a great way of keeping small hive beetles from becoming a problem in your hive. It works, I, for the sugar brick it's ideal that this is on the very top of the hive, but I will say if your top box doesn't have many bees in it, the bees may not come all the way up to the top to really eat that sugar brick. If that's the case, you can put it between boxes. So you can put it in the, uh, in the warmer months. I would only recommend this when daytime temperatures are 60 degrees or above. You don't wanna break up the cluster this much in cooler weather. But in warmer weather, you can put it between boxes and you can put your sugar brick and your pollen patty in there and then put your top box back up on top. Um, you could do this uh, between these two boxes. You just gotta watch out for building burr comb. Um, if, they're, if it's a really strong hive and you're feeding heavily or you've got a great nectar flow, the bees are gonna fill this extra space with burr comb. If you're in the middle of a drought or it's starting to cool off and your hive is, doesn't have a lot of nectar or syrup coming in, probably not an issue. So you can go between, um, just you just gotta keep a little closer eye on it. I wouldn't do this if you've got a lot of brood up in this top box. You don't wanna separate your brood box that much. But in this situation, I've got all my brood down in these two boxes. I've got this super back up on top that we put on after we extracted honey. There's no, there's no brood up here, not a ton of bees. And I want that sugar brick and that pollen patty right up close to the heart of where all my bees are. So in that case, it's okay to put it down below. But if you've got this top box, you know, if you've just got two deep boxes and they're both pretty full of bees, just putting it up on top should be sufficient. So give it a try, um, reverse it for wintertime usage. And uh, I think you'll be thrilled with how well it keeps small high beetles from being a problem when you're feeding <clears throat> sugar bricks or pollen patties. So there we go, folks. Um, and like I said, I probably would have, I had a, one more video I was hoping to do, but uh, about that time my phone died from being overheated. So, uh, all right, so let's talk about September and uh, what you need to be focusing on on your bees that we didn't get to cover in the video, which there, there were a few things that we didn't uh, cover in the video. So uh, we'll cover them, we'll cover them here. So this is the current drought map. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, it looks pretty rough compared to even a month ago. Um, obviously the, the red and deep red is just incredibly severe drought. Um, you know, drought stressed plants are really struggling to produce pollen in South Central United States. Um, Southeast has good moisture in, in most areas, but there are some patches of drought starting to emerge and the bees are really struggling to come out of the summer dearth in many areas. You know, in a lot of these areas, we usually see this boom of bee strength. Um, as the, the weather cools off, we get fall rains, the fall forage really starts blooming, and we really just see the bees kind of explode in the, the fall, which is exactly what we want to see because they need to grow a lot in order to really survive the winter successfully. That's harder to do when there's not a lot of fall forage. In some areas, even if it starts raining now, there's not enough time for those fall plants to really start blooming. So, um, I mean, if you're in Southeast Texas, you know, or Central Texas or Louisiana, uh, you know, man, Minnesota, I mean, some of these areas are just really, really hard hit right now. So that's where feeding that pollen patty as insurance can be super, super helpful. So um, it's pretty hot, it's pretty dry. I, I went back to September of 2022 uh, and uh, our, our webinar in September of 2022. And it was kind of the opposite. We'd had lots of rain over the summer. Things were looking good. Drought map wasn't that bad. 
And uh, it's just a pretty different story for, for this year. You know, normally this time of year, we're starting to see a, a pretty wide variety of plants blooming. But uh, we are seeing, I am seeing some fall, fall blooms, but they're, they're much smaller. The plants are much smaller. They're not blooming as much. And even if they're blooming, that doesn't always mean they're producing nectar or pollen for the bees to forage on. So um, again, this isn't true everywhere. This is where knowing your bees is really important and seeing what's going on in your beehive is really important. Um, it's not like this is catastrophic. I mean, hey, it's hot in the South. I mean, that's that's kind of how it is in the South. The, the key thing, all you really need to do as a beekeeper is you might just need to throw a few pollen patties on there um, and, and you might need to feed them a little more syrup. That's, that's, it. that's it. So it's not like you need to go spend two hours in your bees doing something special. Just up the feed a little bit, uh, especially for pollen patties, to make sure that um, they've got the nutrition they need going into winter. And I always say this just as a disclaimer, and I always feel a little bit weird because we're selling pollen patties. And I, I, I hate someone who's giving advice to, oh, go buy this thing we sell. Um, but I always tell people, try it on half your bees. Don't do it on the other half and see what works for you. There are regions in the country where you've got strong pollen flows, uh, you've got strong nectar flows, and they don't need pollen patties. Other areas, they're critical. So uh, if you're skeptical, um, try it on a few hives, do a little test, do a little study, measure the difference. Um, I, do wanna, I do wanna do a quick poll. Um, oops. Not that slide. Uh, I want to do a quick poll at, with with this topic. Um, I want to see how the honey flow ended for for you guys. So we've done this poll three months in a row, um, and the question is, how was your harvest or your projected harvest? Was it better than normal? Normal? Worse than normal? And I asked this back before any of you had really harvested honey. I guess it was back in June, which was before most people harvest. And I asked it again in July before harvesting. And I want to ask it again, just because I'm curious. I'm curious how good of a job you guys did predicting what your flow, what, what your harvest would end up being. Um, and then what it ended up being. So this is super interesting. I mean, you guys are so impressive because this is basically what you said back in June. About a third of you said better than normal. About a third of you said normal. And about a third said worse than normal. And that's exactly what this poll is still showing. It's basically broken. 33% says better than normal. 37% say normal. 32% say worse than normal. So, uh, which is very close to what you guys said back in June. So kudos. I mean, you guys are rocking the prediction. Uh, you guys are doing a great job predicting uh, what your... Uh, what your crop was going to be and, and you were pretty accurate. So, so yeah, a third, a third, and a third, uh, better, normal, and worse. So super, super duper interesting. Um, one other quick thing, a uh, poll, and this one's a little bit selfish, but I love getting your opinions. Um, we've, we're have we pretty proud of our super suits. Uh, we, we put a ton of effort into making them uh, better and, and building our super suits. And we are uh, going through a big revamp of them again. Um, about once a year, we... Uh, we give a lot of these super suits away to all different beekeepers and uh, different commercial beekeepers. And we say, look, tear them up, find their flaws, figure out what we can improve. And once a year, we kind of go through and rebuild and improve them. And we're doing that right now. We're, we're looking at making bigger zippers. Uh, we're putting, you know, adding some padding in some places, taking it away in others, changing the track of the zipper. Um, we're working on the, the, the veil to make it easier to see through. Um, it'll be a while before it all comes out, but uh, we're making improvements. And a big debate we're having right now is, should we leave the zipper veil? So right now in our super suit, you can unzip this veil and open it like you see in this picture. Um, you can get a drink of water, um, but you can also get a drink of water through the screen. We're curious if you guys like and use that feature or if we should do away with that zipper. Obviously, you can unzip it at the neck and take it off. But do you need the zipper to where you can unfold the face? Uh, do you like that? Or do you feel like it's uh, not something that you really use? So um, I'm going to do a quick little poll here. 
to ask you guys, do you like this feature or not? Or do you just not care? So anyway, you get to decide, do we, do we take it out or do we leave that feature in? Um, uh, we, we always want to ask you guys what, what you think, uh, as far as the products that, that we sell. Um, so it looks like 44% of you say, leave it 20% of you, 28% of you say, don't need it or take it away. And 28% of you say, I don't care. So, um, I'm sorry, 45% say, yes, we want it, leave it. 27% uh, of you say, no, we don't need it. And 28% of you say, I don't care. So, um, okay, super helpful. Thank you, guys. Um, with those kind of stats, I'll have to take it back to our product guys, but there's a chance we may uh, sell a variety without it. Our com like We have a company called Commercial Bee Supply located up in the Midwest that just sells to commercial beekeepers. In those bales, we do not have that unzip feature. Um, so we might just uh, leave it, but stock veils that don't have that feature in case you want to just buy the veil portion separately that doesn't have it. So anyway, cool. Sorry, little uh, uh, got a little sidetrack there, but thanks for humoring me and giving me your feedback. Um, one thing I want to address is fall splits, because this is something that comes up a lot. You know, should we do fall splits? How do we do fall splits? How late can you do fall splits? Um, I, I'm not going to, well, I am a little bit going to get into how to do a successful fall split, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I do want to highlight that I've done a lot of fall splits. I've done fall splits in Texas. I've done fall splits in Minnesota. I've done fall splits in North Dakota. I've done fall splits pretty much everywhere in between. I've done uh, winter splits in California. Um, I mean, I've done splits all over the place and tried all different methods. Here's an interesting statistic that I have found to hold relatively true with the exception of Southeast United States. So if you're in Florida, you know, and you're in Miami, an area that you can just raise bees all winter long, that's an exception. Outside of Florida, I have generally found that splits made after the 4th of July tend to have about a 50% survival rate to the next spring. So splits made, I'll say it one more time, splits made after the 4th of July they might look good going into winter, but usually by the time winter's over and when I'm counting up what survived the winter, it's usually about 50% on splits that were made. So for some people, that's okay. That's an acceptable number. Just keep in mind that I'm not saying that's going to be true for everybody every time, but the survival and success rate of late fall splits after the 4th of July um, is pretty rough. Now, when I make them before the 4th of July, it's, you know, 80, 90%. Um, but trying to really grow bees uh, in a summer dearth or as the bees are trying to shut down going into winter is tough. I'm not saying don't do it, but it's tough. If you do want to do it, here's how I do it. Um, I don't take a strong hive and just split it in half. Like I, I don't take a strong hive and split it like I normally would. You know, normally in the spring, we take a good strong hive and we divide up this whole hive into multiple smaller hives, right? That's the principle of splitting. In the fall, I don't do that because I don't want to risk killing all my big, strong, amazing hives. You know, if you take, you know, 10 beehives and split them all up three ways and turn it into 30 beehives, now you've got 30 mediocre strength beehives. And now you've kind of put your whole operation, I shouldn't call it your operation, you put your whole uh, all, your, all your bees at risk. Now you have a bunch of mediocre hives that you got to grow really fast going into the, the winter. My preference when I'm making fall splits is I take one to two frames of brood and bees out of all of my hives that are strong. And I put four to five frames of brood and bees together and that's my split. Uh, that way, you know, your, your good, strong, big, healthy hives this time of year aren't going to miss one or two frames of bees and brood, as long as they're, you know, 
two deep boxes, mostly full of bees and brood. Uh, they're never going to miss it. You know, you give them a couple, a couple, you know, a gallon or two of syrup, give them a pollen patty, make sure mites are under, under control. They'll never miss a bee. Um, they'll they'll make it to the winter, no problem. So that's how I prefer doing it. So taking a couple frames out from a lot of hives, put it all together, make a five, six frame of brood split. Um, and then you're going to obviously put a mated queen with that split. You're going to feed it heavily, um, you know, give it, you know, put a second box on it, give it two or three gallons of syrup, give them pollen patties. And uh, that's your best shot at getting through the winter with uh, with successful fall splits without jeopardizing your stronger hives. Um, inside fall hives, I mean, kind of like we saw in the video, I'm seeing anywhere from three to six plus frames of brood, you know, really good hives, some of them have eight frames of brood. You know, six is kind of what I'm seeing on a lot of big healthy hives, weaker hives are more in the three frames of brood range. That's gonna vary a lot depending on where you are. You know, up in North Dakota where my brother is right now, you know, our bees up there are starting to shut down. You know, they've only got a few weeks of uh, left before, you know, it might start snowing. So areas like that, obviously, are going to be really starting to shrink down that brood nest versus Texas. You know, we still have, oh, goodness, I hope not eight weeks of warm weather, but uh, we probably have, you know, till the end of October or uh, into November before you really start seeing uh, a dramatic reduction in, in brood. Just a reminder, you know, this is your final shot, really, no matter where you are in the country, this is your final shot at effectively treating varroa mites. Um, I'm going to rephrase that a little bit. You need to have varroa mites under control at this point. There are certainly treatments that work very well when there's no brood in the hive, you know, like oxalic acid, uh, hop guard, you know, a lot of treatments work best when there's no brood in the hive kind of a duh. I mean, any treatment's going to work better when there's no brood in the hive. A lot of treatments say, don't, you know, don't bother applying it until there is no brood in the hive. The problem is a lot of times if you wait till there's no brood in the hive to treat for varroa mites, your hive's pretty much dead at that point, or it's got such a high level of varroa mites that they're not going to survive. So it's important to do those tests now if you haven't already, and make sure that your varroa mite levels are one per hundred bees or less. And um, you, you get that taken care of now, because once the bees start clustering, uh, then it's harder to treat for varroa mites. And then they're also raising that generation of bees right now that are going to survive the winter. And so if, if your hive is infested with varroa mites and those new baby overwinter bees are hatching out and they're being infested with varroa mites, it's just not setting up your hive in a position that's going to survive the winter. So... Do your test, um, do a treatment if needed. Um, and if you if you did treat in July, do another quick test and make sure that uh, your levels are still under control. If you need a refresher on varroa mites, check out our July monthly buzz, um, or you can go watch our uh, entire class on varroa management under advanced classes on our website. So if you need a refresher, jump into those and we, we get into more of how to treat if you wanna treat, or in that class, we talk about if you don't want to treat, then what? You know, what's the solution if you don't want to put a treatment in your eye? How do you handle varroa mites? So check those out if you need a refresher on what to do to get rid of varroa mites or to manage varroa mites. Quick reminder, you know, we talked about the CO2 cartridge in the bee yard a minute ago. The sticky boards, um, they're a non-lethal way, like the CO2 injector. They're a way to test for varroa mites that isn't going to kill your bees. Again, the, the sticky board just isn't as accurate. So what I tend to do is if I'm close to the threshold on the sticky board, I usually assume I have a problem. So I'm a little liberal on the uh, uh, when it comes to the sticky board. You can read the instructions there. Uh, you probably don't want me to read them off the screen. But um, the, the key things there is, you know, you're going to put the sticky board in underneath uh, in the entrance, let it sit for 24 hours, um, and then for summer, or late or, or late summer, if there's 11 varroa mites on that sticky board in 24 hours, you need to do something about it. If I put that sticky board in there and I get it, and there's nine <laughs> of varroa mites, I'm still going to take action because again, it's not super accurate. If there's one 
Okay, you probably don't have an issue. Uh, this is something you may see in your hives. It's, it's not terribly uncommon, and that's bald brood. Bald brood is when the bees are uncapping a pupa, and you, you know, you're looking at the cap brood on your frame, and there's these pupa that should be capped because they're in the pupa stage, uh, and, but, they're, but they're uncapped. The bees have uncapped them for some reason. Now, I see this a lot on social media. I see a lot of people posting picture that, pictures of this, and uh, I see a lot of comments where people are saying, oh, hey, that's wonderful. It means your bees are hygienic. They're sensing varroa mites underneath the cappings. They're uncapping it and they're pulling it out. Um, that's great. Well, like most things on social media, you know, you post something and you get 20 answers and one of them might be right. Um, it's, it, it, it is accurate that when the bees uncap pupa and pull them out, they are exhibiting, exhibiting hygienic behavior. That is a good thing. However, it also usually means that you have a very severe varroa mite infestation in most cases. So heads up there. Let's get into a little more detail on this. So if the bald brood is in a really linear pattern and there's a raised lip around the edge of the cell, kind of like you see in this picture, there's a good chance that was caused by tunneling wax moth larvae. The so wax moth larvae can actually get into your comb and they'll tunnel underneath the cells. And as they do that, they're killing the pupa and the bees are trying to pull out that dead pupa. The wax moth is going to go in a pretty linear pattern throughout that comb and thus creating kind of these lines. And this, this previous picture was a good illustration of this. You kind of have this line where the, the wax moth larva could have traveled to kill those pupa. This is pretty uncommon to see. I'm just kind of throwing it out there as a caveat. This is typically found in small, weak hives that can't defend themselves against, uh, against small hive beetles. I'd say I see this like 5% of the time. 95% of the time is more of this random scattering of uncapped pupa, no linear pattern. The cells appear more chewed down. And this indicates a hive is removing that larva or pupa because it's infected with varroa mites. Again, it's a positive trait, but sometimes a negative indicator, usually a negative indicator that you probably have a pretty significant varroa mite issue. So if you're seeing these uncapped cells everywhere, if you're seeing uh, brood pupa on the entrance of your hive, or you're seeing the bees dragging pupa out of your hive, again, it's good because it does mean they're hygienic, but it probably also means you've got a pretty severe problem. This is when you should definitely step in and do a test and then take action against rural mites with some form of treatment uh, or some mechanical means to try to handle rural mites. Don't just see this and go, oh, my bees are hygienic. This is great. I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, hygienic bees are wonderful, but they only, uh, they're not good enough in most cases to fully handle rural mites on their own. Africanized bees do a pretty good job of this. They're very hygienic. Africanized bees can often handle varroa mites on their own. Um, there are some breeders out there that basically sell Africanized bees and advertise as varroa mite resistant. Um, but you're getting super aggressive bees. So, uh, all right. So that's enough on bald brood. Uh, let's talk about transitioning from trickle feeding to winter feeding. Let me check my time here. We're doing good. So I talked a lot about trickle feeding over the summer, and there is a point at which you transition from kind of giving your bees small amounts of syrup, small amounts of pollen, to kind of giving them a lot if they need it to get them where they need to be going into winter. Now, if you've trickle fed all summer long, I, I bet, I bet 90% of you are basically done with bee management for the year. Um, and that's kind of what I was talking about, about in the bee yard today with that, that double deep hive with a medium on top of it that looked really good. You know, they had 30 pounds of food up in their top box. Um, you know, I was basically done except for giving them some pollen patties and making sure the varroa mites are under, under control. But um, I would say in mid to late September, uh, you know, depending on how cool it gets. With the track record we've got right now, I'd probably say like late September 
you're going to transition from trickle feeding to winter feeding. And what that just means is that um, you're going to feed your bees as much pollen substitute as they can eat into November. And, and we'll talk about how long to feed pollen substitute once we get into October and we can start seeing the weather a little bit. I usually stop feeding pollen substitute when my bees largely stop rearing brood. So, I mean, if they're not rearing brood, that pollen substitute has no benefit. So when, when they have largely shut down from a brood rearing per, uh, perspective, that's usually when I stop feeding pollen substitute. But until then, I'm usually giving them a pollen patty every seven to 10 days. For sugar syrup, you know, you, you know, trickle feeding is giving them a fourth to a half a gallon every week to 10 days. Uh, but once they've got that 30 to 40 pounds of stores in the south or 80 pounds of stores in the north, I'm really going to stop feeding um, once they get to that point. However, if you get into late September and you've got a strong hive, two boxes full of bees, and you've only got 10, 15, 20, 30 pounds of food on them, that's when I'm going to start giving them like a gallon every single week until they get up to where I need them to be to survive the winter. The key is that you don't want to wait until the bees are clustering and the daytime temperatures are in the 50s because they're not going to eat the food. So late September, start thinking about, hey, if my bees need a lot of food, I need to start feeding them a lot of food uh, to make sure they've got it stored properly. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. I feel like I, I talked a lot about why feeding pollen substitute is important as an insurance. So I'll skip over that. So I, I mentioned this out in the BR, but I'm going to mention it again because I think it's really important. By the way, there's a great book out there called Fat Bees, Skinny Bees. It's a great, great book to read. But it just talks about the importance of, you know, making sure your bees are cared for nutritionally going into winter um, and uh, to, to raise those healthy baby bees as, uh, as they're being reared for winter. So what do bees need to survive winter? Uh, this was me a long time ago. Um, if, you, if you can't tell by uh, looking at me, this was, <laughs> this was a long time ago. I think I was, uh, I think I was 18 in that picture. This was in Canada. Uh, in New Brunswick in, in wintertime. And out there, you know, their hives needed 100 plus pounds of food to survive the winter. And obviously in the South, it's only 30 to 40 pounds. Up North, it's closer to 80 pounds. But what do they need to survive the winter? They need 30, in the South, they need 30 to 40 pounds of honey or syrup in their second box. In regions with daytime winter temperatures, average daytime winter temperatures in the 40s and 50s. So that's kind of a maybe a helpful gauge for you that if you live in an area where daytime average is 40, 50 degrees, you know, 30 to 40 pounds should be enough. You know, if you have daytime temperatures below 40 degrees, 60 to 80 pounds is really where they need to land. You need to have mites under two per 100 bees. I really like under one, you know, one per 100 bees. I'm gonna disagree with myself there. Who wrote this? Um, and then you need sufficient bee population to survive. I've got a slide on that later to show you what sufficient bee population means. And then it's just a healthy laying queen. So when do you stop feeding? So you stop feeding when your bees have the food that they need. Uh, but if they still need food, when the daytime temperatures are in the 50s, you can stop. When you have a hive with one deep box or more full of bees and they have 30 to 40 pounds of stored in the second box and three to four frames of honey in the bottom box, you can stop. Uh, when a hive that's less than one deep box full of bees has about 30 total pounds of honey stored between all the boxes, you can usually stop. Just as a reminder, one deep frame full is about six pounds of honey. So again, well-fed versus overfed, this frame, just a quick illustration here, this frame on the left is overfed. If this is what your brood box is looking like, your brood nest is looking like, they're, you fed too much. You know, they've got, they're filling in all those cells with nectar or syrup and the queen has nowhere to lay. That's not what you want to see. What you want to see is more on the right, which is a frame with brood in the middle um, and honey around the outside. The caveat to this is if you're within two or three weeks of winter, um, then filling in the brood nest is okay and to be expected. So hive configuration, what should your hive look like as you are going into winter and preparing for winter? 
Um, this is, I'm talking about brood boxes here, not honey supers. So keep in mind, this is fall, winter. Ideally, your hive has two deep boxes um, and one empty super on top. If both brood boxes are mostly full of bees, you can remove that third box in early October if it doesn't have many bees in it um, or if uh, it doesn't have much honey in it. So as you saw in the video, like a lot of my hives right now, they've got two deep boxes and then we kind of threw that honey super back up on top after we harvested honey. And I'm kind of leaving them that way through September because it's still really hot outside. That gives them a hot air, you know, a buffer in the heat. Um, I've got bees and honey up in a lot of those third boxes. You know, if the bees are occupying the space, it doesn't hurt anything to leave it. If that top box is empty, start shrinking them down, you know, and, and that's usually my general rule of thumb is if bees are occupying a space, it's fine to leave it. They don't need to be artificially crammed down. Um, but if they're not occupying the space and the box doesn't have a bunch of honey that the bees need, pull it off. And, and so th that's true of, you know, if, if I'm in the winter and my, and I've, and I'm down to two deep boxes or a deep and a medium box and that top box, that top deep or that top medium, it doesn't have any bees or honey in it, pull it off. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't help anything, but if it's full of honey, you know, I'm going to leave it in case the bees need to move up into it uh, through the winter time. Keep in mind, the bees don't keep the entire inside of the hive warm. They only keep their cluster warm. So it's not like by having a, an extra box up on top, it's not like they're not able to keep the inside of the hive warm. They're just keeping their cluster warm anyway. So, um, you know, probably are not, you know, even if you had a stack of 10 deep boxes, you know, the bees are going to move to where the honey is and cluster. Um, it's not ideal. I wouldn't leave it that way, but they will move to where the honey is in that stack of boxes. They'll cluster, they'll keep their cluster warm. Same principle as a tree out in the woods, right? You know, the bees may have be on the inside of this cavernous opening inside the tree, but uh, but they're, you know, they're not going to keep the whole inside of the tree warm. So fixing weak hives, you know, in the south, we only have one to one and a half months left of growing for the bees. Uh, and so the, the, much less than that if you're further north. And so we don't have a lot of time to fix weak hives if you've got some weak hives. So now is the final opportunity to boost weak hives before winter time. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, how do you assess the strength of a hive? Usually we talk about strength of hives on, you know, are they filling up a deep box or how many frames of bees are there in the hive? A deep, a frame of bees is considered a deep frame covered at least two thirds of bees front and back. Now, if it's 106 degrees, like it was this afternoon when I was out working those bees, it looks like there's not many bees in the box. I wouldn't assess strength uh, in the middle of the heat of the day. I'm going to check first thing in the morning or late in the evening. Um, so when I take off my lid, I'm going to look down like this picture, these two top pictures, and I'm going to, or well, the, the two top pictures and the picture on the left, and I'm just going to count how many frames look like they're covered in bees. So these top two boxes are completely full of bees. You know, those are, that's a box full of bees. The one on the bottom is one, two, three, four, about five frames of bees. And then the picture on the right is one frame of bees. You can see it's about two thirds covered. So you can kind of use this to assess, okay, I've got one box full of bees. I've got two boxes full of bees. I've got three frames of bees. So use this to assess the strength of your hive. That's going to come help. That's going to be helpful on this slide which tells you where your bees need to be by month. So the yellow bar is your goal. This is where I want to see bees. Um, well, I want to see bees up 16 to 18 frames of bees, but you know, we're talking realistic here. The blue bar is a hive that needs work and the orange bar or brown bar is beyond saving. So the numbers on the far left here are the frames of bees. And so you can see that here in September, I really want my hives to have at least 10 frames of bees. That's my goal. So that'd be like a deep and a deep box and a half, you know, or a deep box and a third at least covered in bees. Uh, that's my goal. If it's blue, this blue bar is eight frames of bees. Yeah, they're probably going to be fine with eight frames of bees, but, you know, maybe give them a frame of brood from a stronger hive. 
And then if they're down to four frames of bees this time of year, it's going to be tough to save them. You know, you could really give them a couple frames of brood from a stronger hive, give them a pollen patty, treat for varroa mites, give them syrup. But, you know, four frames of brood, four frames of bees, excuse me, not brood, four frames of bees, it's going to be a little bit tough to save them this late in the game. Not impossible. If you really, really, really want to save them, give them a couple frames of brood, um, feed them. You really got to throw the kitchen sink at them if they're down to just four frames of bees. So um, if you do want to save them, add brood, add bees. Uh, go back and watch our, our June monthly buzz, I think. I, I showed how to add bees and brood to hives. You can also go to our YouTube channel. We've got a video on how to add brood to hives that actually, um, I think that was actually in the uh, July monthly buzz that we went over how to add brood. But we've got, a, we've got a special video just on how to add brood. Make sure Varroa is under control. You know, if I've got a really weak hive, you know, four frames of bees this time of year, my first question is always, why are they so weak? What happened? And so Varroa is a common cause. Varroa and starvation uh, are really, really common. So I'm going to make sure Varroa is under control. I'm going to feed them syrup, assuming they need it. I'm going to feed them pollen substitute. I'm only going to give them a half a pound a at a time. I'm going to get that pollen patty. I'm going to tear it in half and just give them a half a pollen patty at a time. And then I'm probably going to give them uh, some probiotics and essential oils. I'm going to put some complete B in there. I'm going to use Apis Biologics, you know, one of those supplements to really help boost their strength. And if you do all these things, there's a decent chance you'll save that hive. Uh, not 100%, but there's a decent chance. But in most cases, if they're under four frames of bees, it's better just to combine them with another hive uh, than to go through all that effort. Or you can, you can leave them a few more weeks and see if something changes. Quick reminder, if you haven't already, uh, remove queen excluders. That's important to do this time of year because you don't need queen excluders on your hives. Uh, they, are, they are going to prohibit the movement of that cluster throughout the winter, and you don't want that cluster to move through the queen excluder and leave your queen trapped down below and she freezes to death. So remove that queen excluder if you haven't already. Insurance reducers, you know, the general rule of thumb is that when daytime temperatures are consistently in the 60s, it's time to add queen excluders. So here in the south, we're nowhere close. <laughs> um, if you're more in the north, you might be getting there. But, uh, you know, when temperatures are consistently in the 60s, that's when it's time to add your queen excluder. Your, your entrance reducer, I always, I always say queen excluder. Entrance reducer, daytime temperatures in the 60s. Um, okay, so we've got about 15 minutes left, 15, 20 minutes. I want to go over requeening um, and how we do that in the fall because a common element in weak hives is poor queens. So if you've got a hive that the varroa mites are under control, they have plenty of food, you've done everything right, but they, the brew doesn't look great um, and they're still weak, then there's a good chance it's a queen problem. And so you can requeen in the fall. Now you've got to do it pretty quick. I mean, usually the ideal time is all new. Um, I think uh, at, at TBS, we do, I was, I was in one of our stores today and there was a bunch of, there was several boxes of queens in there. So I know that we do still have queens, but this might be our last week or next week, maybe our last week. The most queen readers are not going to keep selling queens for much longer. So you're kind of in your final window to requeen a hive if you, if you need to. So if you're trying to find a queen, the key is uh, to go to our YouTube channel and watch our video on how to find a queen. Uh, I'll, I'll include the video in the, uh, the e-blast that'll go out tomorrow that kind of summarizes in this whole webinar and, and gives a link to it. I'll include how to find a queen in the links there, but go to our YouTube channel. We've got multiple videos on how to find queens. So spring versus summer, if we're kind of comparing the pros and cons, the pro of requeening in the spring is your hive gets a sudden burst of strength before the honey flow. It's a little easier to get them to accept a new queen. If you requeen in the summer, queens are more readily available. It's easier to find them because there's not as much demand. 
and the hive gets a sudden boost of strength and a boost in population going into winter. My recommendation is in general to do it in the spring, you know, April, May. Um, it's just a little bit safer, a little bit easier, tends to be a little more flawless. Um, there's some considerations if you're doing it in the fall, which we'll talk about, but there's nothing wrong with doing it in the fall. It's better to go ahead and requeen if you have a struggling hive or a bad brood pattern. It's better to do it now than to try to wait till spring because waiting till spring, you know, by the, if you've got a hive that needs requeening, do it now. Uh, because they are not going to grow in February, March, and April like they need to uh, with a poor queen. One important distinction is summer brood versus a failing queen. You know, in the summer months, when especially when it's hot and dry, the brood doesn't look great. I mean, this is a pretty average brood frame for a lot of hives in the summer. The, the brood pattern tends to get a little more spotty, um, and that's that's not that uncommon. So, I tend to look at the quantity of brood. I mean, if, if you've got eight frames of brood, I, I wouldn't worry about requeening in the fall. You know, there's a good chance that that queen is doing just fine. I always look at multiple frames too. If you've got one or two frames or the brood's kind of sporadic, but you've got three or four other frames that the brood pattern is really compact, no big deal. Um, she was probably just laying around nectar or pollen on, on the frame. So, um, don't think that just because you've got a little bit of spotty brood, you've got to requeen. Um, I'm usually requeening in the fall when I see spotty brood, this poor brood pattern, and I don't have much of it. You know, I've only got three, four frames of brood, and my hive isn't doing great strength-wise. Um, in those cases, I'm going to requeen. I'm going to give them a frame or two of cat brood from another hive to boost them up, and and that should pull the hive through. So. Here is the key to successfully requeening this time of year. Feed pre and post introduction. This is so important. Bees accept queens much more readily when they have food coming into the hive. That's why spring tends to be more successful because you have more of a natural nectar flow coming in. In the fall, we often don't have that great of a nectar flow. So feed syrup. It can be a one-to-one -one syrup, um, but give them you know, a half a gallon the week before you're going to requeen, give them a half a gallon as you put the new queen in so that they've got this food coming in and that makes them a little more eager to accept that queen. Don't remove your old queen or don't kill your old queen before you have possession of your new queen. Right? This is a general rule of thumb no matter the time of year because plenty of people uh, say, well, that queen's supposed to show up on September 6th and they go out and they kill their queen on September 5th and then the queen doesn't show up for two or three days, or she shows up dead. So make sure you've got your healthy queen in hand, then go out and remove, kill your old queen. Quick note on queens this time of year. When it's hot outside, be super careful with those queens. Request that that queen is held at the post office. Do not have her delivered to your house. Because the last thing you want is that queen rolling around in a UPS truck or a postal delivery truck for six hours at a hundred degree day. She'll overheat, even if she's not dead. If a queen overheats, it can damage her to where she doesn't lay properly. So pick up the queen from the post office or the UPS distribution center. That way you can get her directly home. You can keep her cool, keep her out of direct sunlight, You know, keep her at room temperature until she goes into that hive. My recommendation is installing the new queen within a few hours of removing the old queen. I've got a video on YouTube on how to do it all on the same trip. You know, so if your bees are not uh, in your backyard, then go to our YouTube channel. I've got a video that just came out about a month ago that shows, or actually I think it was July it came out. Uh, it shows how to requeen in one trip. So go remove your queen, install a new queen. Um, and regardless, at least within a few hours, install the queen cage into your new hive. And uh, you're going to let her, obviously, let her sit for about a week. And the bees are going to chew through that candy and release her. I'm going to come back and check about seven days later, make sure she's out, make sure I'm seeing eggs and larvae. I'm looking for one to two eggs per cell. 
Um, if I see queen cells all over the place, that's a good indication they did not accept the new queen. If they did not accept the new queen, if you if you go back seven days later and there's queen cells all over the place, you don't see any eggs, um, I'm just at that point, I'm going to combine that hive with another hive. I'm not going to try to order another queen and say that it was already a weak failing hive to start with. I'm just going to combine it with another hive. Um, if I go back in seven days and I don't see queen cells everywhere, but I also don't see eggs, I'm going to close them up and I'm going to come back in another three or four days because it could be she just got off to a slow start laying. I'm going to come back, check it again, and you may see eggs and larvae at that point. So um, I don't, I'm not getting into combining hives this month. We'll talk about how to combine hives, when to do it, when not to do it in October. If you really want to know before October, then go to our YouTube channel. We've got lots of videos on how to combine hives, or you can go to our October 2022 monthly buzz and uh, get a sneak preview on combining hives. So this is, uh, oh, well, I, I got ahead of myself here. But these, you know, the pictures on the left here, these are obviously cap queen cells. Good indicator that queen was not accepted. The picture on the right here is a queen cell that's already hatched out. You can see that feathering on the opening there. Good indicator. This should means the queen chewed out. Um, if you go into your hive and you see queen cells, but you also see eggs, uh, and and that they did accept that queen and she's out and she's laying, but you still see queen cells. My recommendation is wiping all those queen cells out. This can happen. I mean, sometimes you know when you introduce a new queen to a hive, the bees haven't recognized her, aren't, aren't recognizing her pheromone. They may go ahead and start rearing queen cells. And then uh, they may not have torn them down even when that new queen was released, even when the new queen was released. That new queen is supposed to, if, if she reads the bee books, she's supposed to go to a little hole in that queen cell, sting that developing queen, and get rid of her competition, but she doesn't always make it around to the cells. The problem is if you leave these queen cells and you have your new mated queen in a hive, that virgin queen will hatch and nine times out of 10, he will kill that queen you just introduced your hive, introduced to your hive. And you just spent 40 bucks on a queen that just got killed by a virgin queen. And the odds that that virgin queen is gonna go successfully mate this late in the year is pretty slim because in colder regions, the bees are already kicking out the drones. In hot, dry regions, they kicked out a lot of the drones because it was so hot and they're in a dearth. So it's unlikely that virgin queen is going to mate properly. I think this actually happens quite a bit in the spring as well, and people just never notice it. Like they put a mated queen in, um, they don't come back in seven days, they come back in two or three weeks. They see eggs, they go, oh, I guess we're good to go. When in fact, they might have been, it might have been killed by a virgin and now that virgin's lay. Uh, and, and no harm, no foul. I mean, you've got a queen in your hive, you just may have wasted the money. So the, the key is to always go back in in seven to 10 days, make sure you see eggs and larvae, and then wipe out any queen cells that are there if you do see eggs and larvae. So again, if you don't see eggs and larvae, but you do see queen cells, she wasn't accepted, I would wipe out those queen cells before I combine it with another hive because you don't want that virgin to hatch out in the hive you just combined it with. And now that virgin kills the queen in that hive you combined it with. So either way, wipe out the queen cells. The final option is you can just leave them. I mean, you can just leave it and see if they pull through. I mean, you can see, you know, those cells will hatch out see if the virgin ends up mating. Maybe maybe she'll get lucky and there's enough drones left that she will mate properly and start laying before uh, winter gets here. So no no harm in, in giving her a shot and seeing what happens. So um, with that, uh, that pretty much wraps up tonight. Just as by way of reminder, um, I will send out a email tomorrow and it'll have links to all the products. It'll it'll will link to like that that uh, sugar brick tray. Will link to the CO two um, uh, varomite testing thing, Rabob. Um, those are probably sell out like in the next couple of days. So you might want to grab one if you want one. 
uh, like tonight uh, because there is a pretty limited supply of that. We we bought almost all of them in the country uh, from the manufacturer and and uh, still wasn't many. So we won't have any more. The manufacturer won't have any more this year. So what's out there is what's out there and uh, we won't have any more until next uh well, late winter, uh, 2024. So, but that email will go out tomorrow. It'll have recordings, links to videos, et cetera. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we ended a couple of minutes early, um, which is, wow, I don't think that's ever happened. So you get 10 minutes of your evening back, um, but we will hang out. Uh, James, Sherry, and I will hang out and answer questions in the Q&A. So if you do have uh, questions, yeah, feel free to keep putting them in the Q&A box and we'll hang out for another five, six minutes and answer any questions that you guys have. So um, I will see you in October, um, if not before, and hope you guys stay cool out there and take care of your bees and we'll see you soon.